Okay, so if not, let's go ahead and get started. As usual, I'm gonna go ahead and record this and I'll post it on your Canvas page. So in section 3.6, we are looking into exponential growth and decay, and then that'll lead us into the derivatives and then the logarithms. So let's do it this way. I have just a couple of examples that I'd like to go over. Again, these are typically word problems. So we'll need to do summaries and kind of take our word problem approach. But first, let's just quickly review our exponential functions. So an exponential function will typically look like f of x equals a times b to the x. And again, notice the placement of the variable. So x is the only variable. These are your two parameters that will typically be given. But we do have some restrictions. So b has to be positive. We'll assume our base is positive. If it's not, it will get absorbed into the coefficient. Also, we don't want b to equal one. If b is one, then this is trivial. It would be a constant function. So in order to define an exponential function, positive, not equal to one, and then your coefficient. And then remember these, if it's growth, look like this. But we also will look at an example where we have decay that'll decay down to the horizontal asymptote. In either case, our domain is all real numbers. And then our range, as long as it's not transformed, is zero to infinity. Again, notice I use parentheses here on the zero because we have a horizontal asymptote. So we don't actually ever touch zero, we just get arbitrarily close. So that's the information that you picked up in an algebra course. But now what we want to do is we want to find the rate of change. And again, anytime I see the word rate, I immediately think of derivatives. So there's this definition that the text provides, and I'll write it down, and we'll use this in the next example. So in general, if y of t is a quantity y, at time t and the rate of change of y with respect to t is proportional. to the size of y of t in time, then we have the following. So I'll give us a minute to decipher all of this. So we just have some function, y. It's related to time, and we're going to take its derivative. And in doing so, it'll be proportional to the size of y then you can say dy dt, so its derivative is just k times y. So this is one of those important equations that we need to know. And here, k is a parameter. k is a constant parameter 
which we define as the natural growth or decay. So if you are given a derivative and they're asking for you to state the growth or decay, then you just look at the constant. So we've done this before. Let's do it in terms of a population model. So I have two examples here I'd like to do. Let's start with the formula, y of t equals y of zero times e to the kt. So you've seen this before. I've done this in terms of money. So we did this in terms of a principal and continuous compounding, or what's also known as PERT. So some of you might have heard this phrase before. So y of zero is just your initial population. E is just an irrational number. K is that natural growth or decay constant. And then T is your variable. So there's only one variable, T, and then everything else would be provided. So let's say that in some country, we had a population of 25, 60, let's do it in millions, in 1950. So they went out and they took a census and it was a rather large country back in the 50s. And then it grew even further by the 60s. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume exponential growth. So not linear, not logarithmic. We want to assume exponential. And then for part A, let's predict the population in 1993. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this formula. And instead of calling it Y, let's maybe call it P of T for population. P of zero, E to the K T. So you'll notice they didn't give us K. Our job is to go find it. So for a lot of these exponential problems, that's the first thing that you'll need to do is find K. So. Here's how we will do this. Let's assume that time started in 1950. <clears throat> so if time started in 1950, I need to go first of all to 1960. So that would give me 10 years. And my initial population, we said, was 2560. And then E to the KT, and T is 10. But we know that should equal the population in 1960. So the very first thing that I'm doing is using my two pieces of information from the problem. That way I can solve for K. So this is the equation that I'm going to solve for. 
So let me go ahead and just rewrite that. Okay, so we have 2560 equals oh, times E to the 10K equals 3040. So then I'll divide both sides by 2560. Now, maybe using the chat or the microphone, how do I undo the natural E? Yeah, I take the LN of both sides, good. So if I LN E to the 10K, and then LN my fraction, that leaves me 10K. And then divide both sides by 10. <clears throat> Be a little bit careful with your fractions here. Make sure that one stays nested inside the LN. And then the 10 goes on the bottom. And I went ahead and I rounded this. So 0 0.01718. Five. Now, keep in mind, I still have not yet predicted my population. All I have done is solved for K. So if we go back to our original equation, I can now write it down with all of the parameters. So what I have now for the equation is P of T is equal to 2560, two, my initial population in the 50s, E, and then K, we now know 0 0.017185, and then times T. So let's make a couple of observations here. We now know our growth rate. So our population is growing at a rate of approximately 1.7%. So that comes from here. So I do think it's worth taking a moment to maybe look at a graph of this. So let's go ahead and pull up Desmos. So y equals two five six zero. Oops. Okay, so the first thing that you'll notice is I'm going to have to zoom quite a ways out. We don't care about quadrant two because nothing is negative. So here we can see how fast this population really is growing. So you can kind of zoom in, get a little more centered. Here's your Y intercept at 2560. So you can see that happening here, our initial population. And then it just grows rather rapidly. So I like these exponential functions. Um, they kind of show you how quickly things can get out of control, especially with population dynamics. So even though our growth rate isn't very large, it's only 1.7%, you can see just how quickly that will affect the population. 
So the whole point of this was to find the population in 1993. So if I'm trying to find the population in 1993, remember 1950 was what we were calling zero. So maybe using the microphone or the chat, what should I plug in for 1993? Yeah, good, Brody, 43, exactly. So now I have 2560E to the K, 17185 times 43. So just be careful with your order of operations. Multiply first, then raise that exponent, and finally multiply by the 2560. So you should get approximately 5360. But remember, we were talking about a population. So my sentence, I would say in 1993, we predict 5360 million people. So now we've made our prediction, we can do some management. We know how fast it's growing at that particular time. Maybe you want to predict even further. So let's say I wanted to do the population in 2020. So if I continued with this train of thought, P of 70 would work. So if I took 1950 and I added 70, I'd get my 2020. Then you can plug it into our equation now that we have formulated it. Zero, e, zero point zero one seven one eight five times 70. And then I rounded and I got approximately 85.24. And again, remember, this is in millions. Any questions with this problem? Okay, so if not, then I think we should work on a decay problem. So this was exponential growth. Let's now do exponential decay. And the most common thing that you'll see, again, for those STEM majors are things like half-life. So let's talk a little bit of chemistry. So if you have the half-life of something, you start with a certain mass and then after time goes by it will reduce in half so in this next example i pulled from the text we'll do a radium problem so half-life is decay so let's say we have radium 226 and its half-life is actually rather large, 1,590 years. So again, what this is telling me is it's telling me if I start with a certain amount of mass, like say 100 grams, it will take this long for that to be cut in half. So it'll decay, but it's decaying really slowly. So I have a couple of problems I'd like to work on here for the decay. Again, let's just say we start with a mass of 100 milligrams. Then we want to write down the formula that we could use for predictions. So we'll just say find the formula after t years.
So it'll look really similar. Instead of using populations and Ps, maybe I'll use M for mass. So M of T is equal to the initial mass, M of zero, times E to the KT. So it all starts the same. I will need to use my information in the problem to find K, just like we did in the previous example. So here's how we're going to do this. Let's start on the right-hand side. My initial mass I'm claiming is 100 milligrams. Then what I'm going to do is put in my time, 1590. That's the half-life time. And then maybe using your mic or the chat, what would half of the original mass be on the left-hand side? Yeah, good. So if I started with 100 milligrams, after my half-life has passed, I should have 50 milligrams. So I could then divide both sides by 100. 1590K. Then just like we did in our previous problem, I will take the natural log of both sides. So LN of 0 0.5 will equal 1590K. So recall when I took the natural log of the right-hand side, they undid each other and the exponent comes down. So from here, I will divide both sides by 1590. So I will end up with the following. K is equal to LN of 0 0.5 divided by 1590. Now we can put this all together in our formula. So M of T is equal to our original 100 milligrams times E to the K times T. So maybe I'll put the T right up here. So now we've found our parameters. We know K, our growth rate, or our decay rate rather. We know our initial mass. So now we have our formula. So that would be part A. And then for part B, let's find the mass after a thousand years. You already have the formula. So all you have to do is plug a thousand in for T. So M of 1000 is equal to 100 E to the K. times a thousand. And again, just be careful with your order of operations. Multiply first, then divide, raise it to the exponent, and then finally multiply by the 100. So after a thousand years, we would have approximately 65 milligrams. Now, this should all make sense. Remember, our original half-life was almost 1,600. So I wouldn't expect it to be all the way down to 50, but somewhere in between 50 and 75. So then there's one other type of question that we can ask. And again, this will involve logarithms. So instead of asking what the mass will be like after so much time, maybe I am given a mass and I want to know how long it will take for it to reach that mass. 
So this was finding mass. The next question is finding time. So when is the next question? Will mass be 30 milligrams? Again, keep in mind some of those critical thinking skills. I know right now that it should be more than 1590 years. And I know that because that's the half-life and half was 50. So it's gotta be longer than that in order for it to continue to decay. So as I'm working on my solutions, I like to think about these things as just kind of a mental check. So let's go ahead and start with our equation initial amount, and then our decay rate. T, that's the thing that I'm looking for. And I'm going to set that equal to 30. So the first thing I'll do is divide both sides by 100. Get 0.3. Then I can natural log both sides. So here it will cancel with the E. So I'm just left with ln of 0.5 T over 1590. And that should equal ln of 0.3. And then I have one more algebraic step. Let's go ahead and multiply the 1590. So ln of 0 0.5 times t equals 1590 ln of 0 0.3. And then divide by the ln of 0.5. So here is the solution exactly. But typically when you're working in the science community, you wouldn't report this exactly. You would put it into a calculator. That doesn't have a lot of meaning to most people, but typically people know what that means. So it will take approximately 2762 years for 100 milligrams to decay to 30. So this is going to be really useful, for instance, if you're a chemist um, and you want to know how long your substances will last, then you can do these types of calculations with these natural logarithms. So there are a couple of other really good examples in your text. Again, I'm hoping that a lot of this is review. Are there any questions with this material? Okay, so what I like to do typically is just write a quick little summary of how I approach these types of problems. So just like before, the first thing that you'll wanna do is write down what you know and what you are trying to find. And then for these exponential growth and decay problems, you'll need to use your given information to find K. So you'll notice in both of those problems, that was the first thing that I had to do was use my two points of data. That way I could solve for K. And then I write down the equation. 
with all the parameters. Once you've done that, then you can answer any of the questions by plugging in what you know. And for these word problems, I'd like you to write them out in sentences. So again, it's not enough just to give me a value. I would like for you to be able to interpret it. Are there any other questions? Okay, so those were the only couple of examples that I had for today. Um, again, if you need any additional help, then you can join me during my office hours today or Wednesday, or send me an email. Um, but I did extend that homework, so it is not due until Wednesday. And I will post this recording as soon as I can. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your afternoon.